This is a low birth weight baby. There's 20 million of these babies born world over every year. Roughly 3 million of them die in the first year of life. And in spite of this, world over, we miss roughly half these babies. Less than half of them are weighted birth, and if found, they're relatively easy to help. This is a TB patient. TB kills more people than malaria and HIV combined. And this is a bud of cotton. In there is a little worm. It's called the pink ball worm. This one worm wiped out large swaths of the cotton crop in 2017, and a thousand cotton farmers committed suicide. I'm Rahul Paniker. I head research at the Wadwani Institute for Artificial Intelligence. We are a nonprofit AI research lab solving large scale social problems with the power of AI. My journey into technology for social good started when I was a graduate student at Stanford. I was getting my PhD uh, at the interface of machine learning and applied physics. I was building optical devices that can learn by themselves to do better imaging for biomedical purposes and for higher speed telecom. But I also puttered around and spent a little time at the Stanford D School, the design school. Well, the Stanford D School is a very fun place. And this is where I learned human-centered design. Long story short, out of a class project that we did, we developed an incubator for premature babies that can work without electricity. Actually, every once in four hours, you need to pour in um, a, a couple liters of boiled water, and this would maintain a precise 37 degrees Celsius, and was designed to be simple enough that it could be used in village homes by illiterate mothers or healthcare workers. With my co-founders, I moved right here to Bangalore to set up this company out from Palo Alto. And just down the road, off, off Richmond Road, we set up the company. We went on to get international regulatory certification, launched the product, scaled to over 25 developing countries, have helped over half a million babies. We were recognized by the World Health Organization as a top innovation in global health. And in 2016, the WHO procured from us to help babies of Syrian refugees in refugee camps in Jordan, units that we made of out here in Richmond Road. At that point, I figured, huh, time to go do the next thing. And there were two breakthrough technologies that I knew would define the next era. One was CRISPR. CRISPR is a gene editing technology that allows us to precisely engineer genetics. It promises ways to cure disease and potentially fundamentally change our nature. The second was artificial intelligence. Back to my academic roots, I could see the changes that have happened in AI and what AI promised was, was the ability to engineer abundance, the ability to create intelligences around us other than our own, a responsive world around us, an Asimovian Gaia. And so I figured that this is the way to go to actually solve our large-scale problems. So coming back to how, how are we helping babies with AI? So the way to find low birth weight babies is to weigh them. It's very simple. And how do you weigh them? Well, we have millions of healthcare workers world over who go home to home. And in India alone, we have about roughly a million ASHA workers. They're supposed to carry spring balances. And you weigh them with spring balances. Seems fairly simple, right, to do this with the spring balance. Unfortunately, we are still missing half our babies, half our low birth weight babies. Why do you think this is? Any guesses? Well, the reasons are many. There are cultural taboos. In many cultures, outsiders are not allowed to touch a baby for the first 30 or 40 days of life. There are supply chain issues. Many of these spring balances remain in state or district headquarters in storage facilities and never reach the healthcare workers. And finally, there's data quality issues. This is a typical register in which data is entered. If you look at the data, you'll see that magically, a very large number of babies weigh precisely 2.5 kilograms, which is the cutoff for low birth weight. So you can imagine what's going on. So here's what we are doing. 
Many of these healthcare workers are increasingly getting equipped with smartphones, and digital pipelines have been established as part of uh, e-health and m-health data collection processes. India, for example, has mother and child tracking system, MCTS. South Africa has Mom Connect, and so on. Integrated into that, we are building a solution where they can take a short video of a baby, and from that, we can estimate weight by doing a full 3D reconstruction of these babies. So how do we do that? It turns out that we learn what is called a latent space of babies. That is a mathematical language to describe baby shapes. And then after that, it's kind of like filling in a crossword. When you have a partial video, you have a few letters in a word. But because you've learned the language, you also know the dictionary, and you can fill in the gaps. And with that, we can do a full 3D reconstruction of the baby. So on the left, you see a typical video, representation of a video that'll be taken, and that's the full inferred model. From this, you can estimate volume and from its weight, because it turns out babies are fairly constant in density. We're all born relatively uniform, to within 3%. And you can do other things for free. For example, you can measure head circumference, length, movement of the baby to assess neurodevelopment, and so on. All of these come for free. And this data is now geotagged and timestamped, providing a barometer in the community for newborn health. But it's important to keep in mind that AI is no silver bullet. Right? All of this has to work in a larger system. For example, AI is only one component to a product. And a product alone doesn't solve a problem. You need to change workflows, reporting structures, data management systems, and that is crafting the entire solution. And all of this has to fit into a larger system, which in this case is the home-based newborn care program. And this is how we need to think of technology interventions at scale. There are five forces that allow this to be possible today. Apart from the fact that AI has made rapid strides, there are large frontline workforces across domains. You have frontline health, healthcare workers. Agriculture, similarly, has agricultural extension workers. Education has teachers. Financial inclusion has frontline agents, and so on. Smartphone penetration, of course, we all know this, has tremendously gone up. Technology acceptance in rural areas has also greatly gone, gone up, thanks to the likes of WhatsApp and ShareChat and Facebook and so on. This was not true even 10 years ago, by the way. And thanks to various government initiatives and large-scale social initiatives, technology backbones have been established with the necessary management and human systems to handle this data. And finally, there's a lot of policy and funding support. There's lots of problems that could be solved. How do you pick what problems to solve? So we think it's actually prudent to ask a few questions. Some of them obvious, but some of them not so obvious. Obvious one, is this a big problem, both in scale and severity? Does it have an AI solution? Not all problems have AI solutions or, not, or even technology solutions. This is an important one. Will solving the AI part make enough of a difference? Turns out there are AI components to many problems. It's not the AI that's always going to change the needle. I'll give you an example. Microscopy in the front line for uh, testing samples, blood samples, or sputum samples, and so on. You know, it's, it's a process that can be automated with computer vision solutions. Turns out the problem is not the counting. The problem is actually collecting the sample, getting the patients to come, or getting healthcare workers to collect samples. So solving the AI part would not make a difference here. If solved, will stakeholders accept the solution? My favorite example here is decision support systems for primary healthcare center doctors. Most things that happen in a primary healthcare center are fairly simple stuff. It can be algorithmized, except for interventional procedures, right? a lot of diagnosis and actually even treatment. But frontline doctors do not want this. They ask, first of all, you think I don't know what I'm doing? And if I keep using this, my patients will think I don't know what I'm doing. So there isn't acceptance there. Importantly, because a lot of these are supervised learning algorithms, does the data exist or can it be created easily enough? Are there partner organizations who have the trust of the community, who have knowledge of the problem areas, okay, who will ensure that we're not barking up the wrong tree and who will help us co-create solutions and pilot? And finally, are there pathways to scaling? Because you don't want to get stuck in the land of pilots. 
coming to TB, what are we doing here? TB is one of those problems where, for example, in India, roughly 1.5 million cases are notified every year. But the estimated burden is something like 3 to 4 million. So we're missing you know, roughly 50% of these cases. And because of that, and TB is a contagious disease, and because of this, we've in fact gone on to develop drug-resistant TB, and extremely drug-resistant TB, and so on. So this is actually a crisis. How do we find these cases? And so we are doing this by looking at correlates of TB. Okay. Where do TB cases exist? Where is the mobility of people? By looking at telecom data, Facebook, Facebook data, et cetera looking at the level of public health systems and looking at correlates to identify where the hot spots are and also where the dark spots are. And then you don't want to send all your, all your healthcare workers to just the hot spots. If we do that, we'll be sending all our healthcare workers to Mumbai. You don't want to be doing that. You want to be sending our healthcare workers to the hot spots as well as some dark spots. And this is a classic reinforcement learning problem called the exploration exploitation trade-off. We are officially AI partners to India's Central TB Division. We also work with a global organization, PATH, that advises many countries in their TB programs. And finally, cotton farming. Here, we are trying to identify pests early. And how do we do this? It's a solution where, like in health, agricultural extension workers have been given apps and solutions that they can use. We are building something where they can take a picture of these pest traps. They're called sticky traps. And with that, identify pests and count them. But we identify and count not just the pests in that field. We can identify what pests. The system can aggregate data over multiple fields. Also knows what's happened historically and predict the trajectory. And from this, predict pest infestations. The hope is that through this, we can address pest attacks on cotton and bring down losses and, like I said, farmer suicides. The possibilities are immense, and there's many, many other problems that we're working on. But I'll leave you with one thought that Marcel Proust told us, that the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. So as we embark on this journey of looking at the world around us through compassionate eyes, I invite you to look at it through the possibilities of an AI lens. Thank you.